This audio presentation is provided by nativecatholic.com. Things right off the bat, but before we do that, why don't we say another prayer to get started? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, for without end. Remember the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. I'm really excited to be here, and um, I know it's been a while since I've been here. It's been a long time, but uh, I always really enjoy coming up here. Um, everything's so paved now. It used to feel like the epic adventure to get up here. And it's still an adventure, but not as epic, because they have paved roads and everything like that. But uh, I remember coming up here back when this room wasn't even built. I remember I came up here for a BCC event a long time ago. And uh, I was even there for the very first youth BCC retreat. I remember that. That was a long time ago. I was there for that one. But uh, I love the, the Benedictines up here. And uh, they've watched me grow up. And they've been a part of my, uh, my faith journey. And I'm always grateful for an invite to come up here. And I just got to speak to the young people downstairs, and I'm excited that I got to speak with them as well. So this is what we're going to do today. I, uh, you know, I, I'm glad Sister didn't have too much of a biography, because sometimes when someone does a biography, they set you up, and then people have this expectation, and they're like, oh, really? He didn't really do all that, you know? But uh, I just want to tell you real quickly what um, I am here to do, and my, a little history about myself. I grew up in Hawaii, and I graduated from Kamehameha thought I was going to be a priest, so I went up to Franciscan University in Steubenville to study uh, for pre-theology, and I met my wife there. Um, I finished my master's in theology, and we got married, and we have three beautiful children now. And uh, I'm self-employed. I don't work for uh, a school anymore, but I still, on contract, work for the diocese. I do classes, adult formation education throughout the islands. And uh, coming up here soon, I have a bunch of different ones I'm doing on the neighbor islands as well. So I got a busy schedule coming up here. But uh, my main job is to do my best, and sometimes I, I struggle with this, is to do my best to be a dad. And uh, that's my main vocation right now, and uh, every day it's a learning experience um, for me. But with that said, one of my passions is speaking about the faith uh, that um, has been taught to me by our church and um, a church that I love and that's what I'm going to do here today. Keep in mind that I am not a priest and because I'm not a priest I have no ordination so I don't have any priestly ability to preach the gospel in that sense. All that I have the right to do is to echo what the church already teaches which is a gargantuan task because there is a lot of what the church teaches. A couple things you'll learn about me is I'm just going to say it like it is. And if I'm ever incorrect and someone can show me that, I'm completely open to correction. Because if I wasn't, then I wouldn't really be in it for the church. And for truth, I'd be in it for myself, right? It's not about me being right. It's about the truth being shared. And keep this in mind. In everything I say, this is the fundamental principle that I base everything I share off of and why I love apologetics. It comes from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It says that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we know that Christ is truth. He is the personification and the manifestation of truth. He is the fullness of truth. And so if Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, truth is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Something that is true doesn't change because we've progressed. It's not how it works. I mean, next time someone says, well, we've come so far, I'd be like, yeah, you're right. I mean, we've come so far since Jesus, haven't we? We can't progress beyond the truth and the fullness of truth that Christ revealed to us. I'm sure we can agree with that. 
And so what I like to share is not my, th my, my innovations, and everything I s I'm going to admit, and maybe I need to go to confession right now, everything I'm going to share tonight is 100% stolen from somebody else. <laughs> because I'm going to be sharing with you some of the teachings of the church fathers. We're going to be using a couple of different catechisms, a couple of different um, other theologians who have great insights to the scriptures. And that's what I get it from. And so I'm going to be echoing those sentiments to you today. And what's important for us to know is that when we study the scripture, we're going to go into it in a little bit, that we have something very essential. As Catholics, we have the guidance of the Holy Magisterium. We have the guidance of the Pope in union, the, the Pope and the bishops in union with the, with, with the Pope. We have their guidance in a solemn manner because they are truly the authority in authoritatively interpreting scripture. This is essential because you see, this is what gives us the right to study scripture and for us to look at scripture and to see how it can help benefit our faith. This is essential because if we ever have a question about what the Bible means, the church can provide an answer for us. And this is really important. It says in Luke chapter 10 verse 16, he's speaking to his apostles, he's saying, he who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. He who rejects me rejects the one that sent me. And because he's given us the church, the sacrament of salvation to us here on earth, we need to listen to the church. Because when we reject the church and their interpretation, we're not just rejecting the Pope and the bishops. If we reject the church, which is the body of Christ, we reject Christ. Because that's how he meant to go, but what, how does that work? How, why is it that way? That's just the way he did it. So we need to listen to the church and what they teach. This is really important. And that's really freeing though. It really is freeing. Because unlike other Christians, we don't have to guess at what something means. If we have a question, we have a church that can show us what it means. And we have such a beautiful faith. And you know, I think it was St. Basil that said it the best. I believe so that I might understand. One of my favorite theologians, Frank Sheed, he said that learning about God and studying scripture is like a light bulb. You see, the light bulb represents how much we know, and the darkness around it represents how much we don't know. The more that we learn, the bigger the light bulb gets. But the bigger the light bulb gets, the bigger the darkness around it multiplies. You see, the more we learn about God, the more we realize how much we don't know about God. So it's a lifelong journey. And the name of that book, by the way, from Frank Sheet, I'm going to give you some book recommendations too. It's called Theology and Sanity. We'll, go, we'll say that again at the end. And that's his premise. For you to ever stop wanting to know more about God is to be insane. That's the premise of his book. Because that's what we have. The African people in Africa call it mutima. This desire to be with God. So it's that desire to be with God that makes us sit in these chairs and listen to me. And I'm going to try to make sure that everyone stays up today. But that puts you, that makes you come up here to listen. It's what makes you attentive during homilies. We desire to know more about God, you see? And that's what we're going to do today is study that. And we're going to use some of the most powerful things that Christ has given to us and the church has given to us to study about Him. Now, initially, I realized I didn't have enough time to do five things. We're going to cover one particular doctrine today. And we're going to use the Bible to explain it. The Catholic Church, and this is my premise, the Catholic Church is absolutely the easiest tradition to defend using the Bible. Absolutely. It is the easiest Christian tradition to use, to use the Bible to defend. Because everything that the Catholic Church teaches can be defended using Scripture. Well, Dallas, I don't know about that. I mean, I believe it, but I don't know if it's in the Bible. Well... That's what I try to do, is try to show you how the Bible supports and defends everything the Catholic Church teaches. And remember this, that the Catholic Church, um, given to us by Christ, is the only church instituted by Christ for the salvation of souls. And so with their guidance, we are able, we are able to open up these scriptures. One of the things, and my, my premise, I'm sorry, my, the whole topic was supposed to be to use the scriptures to help define and to find some doctrines, Catholic doctrines, use the scriptures to defend them. But instead of going over five doctrine, I chose one, but before we get into that one, I want to talk about scripture in general. The first thing I want to do is demystify something that's often said about Catholics. It's often said that Catholics don't know their scripture. 
you know, you Catholics, you guys are fine, but you don't know the Word of God. If you just knew the Word of God, then we could get along. Well, to be honest, it doesn't matter what they think of me. But even in that situation, when they say that you don't know the Word of God, they have a fundamental misunderstanding about what it means to be Catholic. And I want you to hear this. This is important. When we speak about the Word of God, that's why I put up here, you know, where is that in scriptures and in parentheses, the Word of God. We need to reflect on what the Word of God is. Now, we're going to see that the Word of God is scripture. It's also sacred tradition. We're going to go through that in a second. But before all of that, as a Catholic, we first and foremost understand the Word of God as Christ Himself. Christ Himself is the Word of God. He is the Word of God made flesh. That's why in the last Gospel of Mass, they always read that same Gospel, because it is the Word made flesh. He is the Word made flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus is the Word. Verse 14, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Right? And so Jesus is the Word. And why do I say that? Every time you go to Mass, every time you receive the Blessed Sacrament, you are receiving the Word of God. So when someone says, you don't know the Word of God, you say, I'm, you misunderstand something. I have an intimate relationship with the Word of God. How blessed we are that when Father and His consecrated hands are able to convect that sacrament, we literally consume Christ. We consume the Word of God. This is important for us to know. Because studying Scripture is essential. Knowing sacred tradition is absolutely essential. Along with that, experiencing Christ in the Blessed Sacrament is essential. Spend time with Christ every day. Spend time with the Word of God every day. If you're not able to make it to daily Mass, spend time before the tabernacle. Spend time in His midst. Spend time in the presence of the Word of God. You know, sometimes it's hard. I, I'm the first one to admit it. We have perpetual adoration at Our Lady of Good Counsel, and I fall asleep. I mean, you get me in that room, about 20 minutes later, boom, right? You know, I wake up, there's a little drool coming down. I mean, you know, I fall asleep. And I remember asking a professor of mine one time, how do I deal with this? Because I keep falling asleep when I'm in adoration. When I'm in, in any church, before any, any church, any sanctuary, before the tabernacle, I fall asleep. How do I get over this? I want to spend time with the Word of God, but I can't. Help me out. And then he gave me a good analogy. He said, well, you know, in Hawaii... Isn't it true, you guys can relate, that when we go out in the sun, we get sunburned if we're out too long? But isn't it true that even if it's overcast, the next day, if you're out, if you're out too long, the next day, even if it was overcast, we're sunburned anyway, right? We get the rays anyway. And he said, listen, in your effort to spend time with the Word of God every day, when you're before the Blessed Sacrament, when you're before the Tabernacle, even if the clouds of distraction get in your way. The Son, the S-O-N, will bless you. And His rays will touch you. And that was so freeing for me, and it's still hard for me to spend tremendous amounts of time there, but I'm getting better. I'm getting better each time I go. So that's the first challenge when studying the Word of God, is make it a point to spend time with the Word of God every day. God knows in heaven that we spend a lot of time watching TV, right? Two or three hours minimum. I mean, we got to watch American Idol, you know? Can't miss the news. Can't we spend some time at the parish, which is probably five, ten minutes down the road from us? Can't we spend time with Christ, the Word of God, and continue that intimate relationship with Him? Absolutely, we can. And for those of you who have the blessing, try to receive the sacrament daily, too. That's a gigantic blessing. And... Uh, that would be awesome if I was able to do that. So um, for those of you who do, totally jealous. And uh, one day soon I hope to be able to do that. The second part of it, before we get into scripture, and then into our doctrine we're going to talk about today, we have to understand that the word of God is also sacred tradition. Now sacred tradition, and I have, by the way, 
I actually wrote out 90% of what I'm going to say on this piece of paper, so you have your notes here. I like to give people takeaways when I teach, so you take it and you actually have it right there. It's a good resource guide. We need to understand, by the way, when we understand, let's go back to A, understanding Christ himself as the Word of God, we see in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, this is the big green one, paragraph 151, um, that Christ himself is the Word made flesh. And so we see it there, crystallized for us. And also in the, um, the third Baltimore Catechism, in response to question 870, it says the Holy Eucharist is the sacrament which contains the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ under the appearances of bread and wine. And so we are able to spend time in the presence of the Word made flesh. Now when we understand sacred tradition, this is B, sacred tradition is also the Word of God. The sacred traditions I'm speaking about are the teachings of Christ and the apostles that were handed down throughout history by either uh, letter or by word of mouth. This is sacred tradition. Capital T, tradition. Sacred tradition. Now, some say, well, I mean, we believe in tradition, but you can't tell me that it's the Word of God. Well, the church has perennially taught that it is the Word of God, and in fact, Scripture itself says that sacred tradition is the Word of God. And we actually have that here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, where Paul is writing to the people in Thessalonica. By the way, 1 Thessalonians was the first New Testament book to be written. That's important to know because this is predating all the other books in the New Testament. He says, We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but at what, as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And so 1 Thessalonians 2.13 actually says, Paul himself, Paul, the apostle, is telling us that sacred tradition, what he says to the people, is the very word of God. And it says, I wrote down underneath there, 1 Peter 1.25, that the word of God abides forever. And just as Christ is the same yesterday, today, and, for it, and forever, just as the word of God abides forever, if the words that were spoken, not written, but heard by the people of Thessalonica, if that is the word of God to them, if it was the word of God to them, the word of God to Paul, then it's the word of God to us. Because it doesn't change. And so we need to understand that sacred tradition is also the word of God. And it's usually disseminated through the teachings of the church who can help us understand that, who has been given to us by Christ, not only as a sacrament of salvation, but also as the divinely appointed interpreter of these traditions. So they help us understand the tradition when we don't understand it. And then lastly, we understand as Catholics, sacred scripture to be the word of God. And sacred scripture is the speech of God. It is te an ustas. It is God breathe. It is God's very word. And we see this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm sorry, that's wrong. You might want to change that. It's not 2 Thessalonians, it's 2 Timothy. I wrote that wrong. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So scripture is also the inspired word of God. A couple of points to be made here. Catechism 881 says sacred scripture is the speech of God as it is put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. And then Pope Leo the Thirteenth in um, Provin Providentissimus Deus, paragraph 20, he also makes it very clear that it is absolutely wrong and forbidden either to narrow inspiration to certain parts of Holy Scripture or to admit that the sacred writer has erred. For all the books which the church receives as sacred and canonical are written wholly in entirety with all their parts at the dictation of the Holy Spirit. And so far is it from being possible that any error can coexist with inspiration, that inspiration not only is essentially incompatible with error, but excludes and rejects it as absolutely and necessarily as it is impossible that God himself, the supreme truth, can utter which is not true. And then Pope Pius X, in his Syllabus and Errors, which is wonderful if you haven't read it, by the way, condemned the idea that divine inspiration does not extend to all sacred scripture. Because there are many people these days who say, sacred scripture is inspired, but only in certain parts. It's only inspired when it comes to salvation. 
But this is not what the church teaches. This is important for us to know. And I see some of you looking at me like you've never heard that. And maybe this is good that you're hearing it for the first time if you haven't. Because scripture is completely inerrant. Because it makes sense here. It says in... Um, it says in Proventissimus Deus, as well as many other encyclicals throughout the teachings of the church, that what is in Scripture is what God intended to be there. And God cannot err. That's, that's silly to think that God would err. And so what's written there is what God wanted. This is what's important to know as we continue on in Scripture. And don't let, this is important, especially for, for the, 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 younger, the younger folks who grew up in this era, don't let anyone ever come and tell you, well, Vatican II changed that. Vatican II did not change that. What changed that is what everyone calls the spirit of Vatican II. What spirit of Vatican II? You mean the spirit that ev eluded being written down? Right? No, if it's not written there, it's someone's false interpretation of it. Sacred scripture is completely inerrant and inspired by God. This is the word of God. And we also have examples from um, we also have some examples from the early church fathers that talk about this as well. So to end this little introductory before we go into sacramentology and the sacrament of confession, which we're going to talk about today, the last thing I want to do is talk about the Bible in general. You see, the Bible is a love story between God and man. And if I can explain it, for those of you who might not have read the entirety of Scripture, I can explain it like this. God created man out of a sheer act of goodness. And he wanted to share his inner blessedness with us. So he created man out of love. He gave him a free will. He created and hoped that we would love him back. He didn't force us to. But he hoped that we would. And Adam and Eve broke that communion with him by disobeying him. God did not kick them out of the garden. They kicked themselves out. They chose not to be with God. You see? And God, the persistent lover, the whole Old Testament in 10 seconds for you. The whole Old Testament is a story of God, the lover, trying to woo his beloved back to him. It's a love story about him trying to bring those, his people back to him. And he succeeds, you know, at least temporarily. Okay, we're going to make a covenant here, okay? I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people, we're going to go on from here. Good to go. All right, God, we're good to go. We make one with, uh, with Adam and then Abraham, uh, Noah and then Abraham. And then guess what we do? We end up worshiping a golden calf. We cheat on God. And God's oh, we've got to make another pact here. Okay, we're going to, I will be your God, you will be my people, we'll move on from here. That's the story of the Old Testament. Over and over again, it's us breaking up with God. And God, the lover, consistently trying to woo us back to him. One of my favorite books of the Bible is the Song of Solomon. Because it's a love story about the lover trying to woo his beloved. And that's what God is to us. We are the beloved and he's constantly trying to woo us back to him. And it reminds me of my wife. I had to ask her out like 17 times before she said yes. When we were, before we, uh, I mean, you know, we weren't even dating then, but she finally said yes. It was persistence. I win, right? But God is persistent like that. And he constantly does that throughout the Old Testament. And then it culminates with the ultimate sign of love, wherein the new and everlasting covenant, the sacrifice of his only begotten son, gives us the new and everlasting covenant where we forever can choose to be his people. And it's up to us to choose him to uh, follow the methods that he's given us to attain salvation and for us to love him. Now, this is important for us to know about scripture. Then we need to know that this is important to know. The Bible, finally, the Bible is a Catholic book. It is a Catholic book. What do I, what do I mean by that? Well, Peter and Paul, they were Catholic. They were. Are you sure? Well, Peter was the first pope. They were Catholic. So what we have here is a Catholic book. It was a Catholic church that put the canon of the New Testament together towards the end of the 4th century. And so the Bible is a Catholic book. So it makes sense to me with that premise that if we believe something, if the church teaches something, if there was a doctrine that the church teaches, that it should be able to be supported by Scripture. That makes sense. Remember this, that we don't limit our understanding of the Word of God just to Scripture, but Scripture has a lot for us as well, because it is, as we've read, the inerrant Word of God. And so what I want to talk about today, I was going to go through several, but I, I want to spend time going through this slowly. I want to talk about the sacraments. And the one sacrament we're going to talk about is the sacrament of confession. And the reason I bring this one up is because I was asked a couple days ago, 
you know, Dallas, why can't I just go to, you know, confess to God myself? Why can't I just say sorry? And I mean, that seems like a common sentiment. Because for an unformed mind, it seems pretty logical. Just say you're sorry and it's good. Because that's what we do with each other. If we do something wrong, we say sorry. So I thought we'd focus on that because this is a very unique teaching. In other words, no one else really teaches this besides the Catholic Church. And I want to show you how any other teaching completely that goes against what the Bible says because the Bible clearly tells us that we must confess our sins to a priest. Oh yes it does. It says that very clearly. And we're going to go through that. But before, before, before we go through that, real quick, another introduction. Everything I've said so far is kind of a primer to get to the main topic. One little more primer that we have to do is what a sacrament is. And let's talk about that for a second. You see, a sacrament, we, we, okay, we're people that need tangible expressions of many things. A lot of the faculties of the soul are simple to manifest. If we're hungry, we eat. If we're tired, we sleep. Right? So we have these tangible expressions of the needs of the soul. Well, we also need the tangible expression of some of the higher faculties of the soul. When we achieve something, I mean, that's why we have a graduation from high school. It's a tangible expression of your accomplishment. Even in college, you, they say walk, right? They, they walk with their diploma. And you know what? I have a lot of people who are like, I don't need to walk. I'm going to not pay for that. I don't need to walk. But you try to keep their diploma away from them. No way. They want their diploma. Maybe they don't need to walk, but they want some sort of tangible expression of what they've done. And so we naturally as humans need a tangible expression of many of the faculties of the soul. And so God works with this. He works with nature for us to um, receive many of the inward graces that he wants us to give, that he wants us to receive. And he often uses symbol and sign. And this is important to know. The sacraments, when you think about it, the sacraments often use signs that make some sense to us. In other words, we can kind of intimate what the sacrament's about just by the sign. This is different than a symbol. If I were to write a big O with like eight lines through it, you would have no clue what I'm trying to say to you. But what if I told you that wherever you see this big crazy O with X's through it, that that means that a saint is buried there. I've given you the code to what the symbol means, right? So you go to the Holy Land and you see your O with a bunch of X's through you like, I learned that this means there's a saint buried here. You have no clue otherwise, but you've learned what that symbol means. So it's completely a symbol. You need to be told what it means. Well, when it comes to the sacraments, God often gives, uses signs. Not just symbols, but signs. A sign is something that can be partly understood. In fact, the Greek origin of the word sacrament comes from the word mysterion, which we get the word mystery from. And what's a mystery? A mystery is something that we partly understand, but partly don't understand. Like a murder mystery. We know someone died. We might even know how they died. We know where they died. You know, maybe even know why they died. But what don't we know? Who did it, right? So it's partly known and partly hidden. That's what a mystery is. And that's what sacraments are. Sacrament comes from that word mysterion. In fact, no one uses that language anymore, but it wouldn't be wrong to call them mysterions, because that's what they are. They're partly revealed to us through their sign. Let me explain. Baptism. If you go and you see a baptismal font, you're going to see water in it, which is the proper matter for baptism. And if you look at that water, you might not know. So let's say you're a, a complete pagan, you've never seen a Christian church before, you've never seen a Catholic church before, and you walk in and you see this water baptismal font. But you grew up in a society that was fairly civilized. You might not know that this regenerates your soul, that it makes you born again with the proper form, that it regenerates and it gets rid of your original sin, makes you part of the family of God, right? You might not know that, but what do you know by looking at water? Huh. I bet this has something to do with being cleansed. It's water. I bet this has something to do with becoming pure. To be cleaned. You see how that sign has some meaning for us anyway. And so God wants to use these signs. He doesn't want to completely hide it. He wants to use natural things for us to experience His love. You see? And that's why we receive His body and blood through, uh, through uh, receiving it in, as a meal almost. 
because we're receiving it in a form that we can understand, a tangible expression of it. God could have chosen differently. He could have chosen a miraculous, uh, supernatural. Not, I, mean, I can't say not miraculous because the Eucharist is miraculous. Baptism is mir miraculous. But he could use some supernatural way that no one can see and all of a sudden we just have this overwhelming feeling or whatnot. But he doesn't. He uses natural signs to impart his supernatural grace, you see. These are what sacraments are. Now, the word, sacrament, the word sacramentum is really interesting. The word sacramentum actually comes, uh, not, it's not, the, what happened was when the language of the church changed from Greek to Latin, they couldn't find a direct translation from mysterion into Latin. They couldn't figure it out. There was no word for mystery. So they found um, something else that actually tells us a lot about a sacrament. On the ears of the Roman soldiers, there was a brand. And this mark on the ear of the Roman soldiers represented what battalion they were a part of and what rank they had. And so this brand behind their ear represented a change in their standing in society and their responsibility. Because if you had a certain mark, you were highly respected. Everything was paid for, right? You have all your housing paid for. Everything was given to you, but you had a higher responsibility. You were like a marine. You were the first to go into battle, right? So this mark represented a change in responsibility and standing in society. And guess what that mark's called? A sacramentum. And so they use that word because not only are these sacraments, these mysterions, uh, uh, you know, an outward sign imparting inward grace, it's also something that changes our standing in society, our, our standing before God and our responsibility before God as well. I mean, think about that. When you're baptized as a Catholic, now, all of a sudden, you have the standing as a child of God. But now you also have the responsibility to abide by canon law. Right? So this thing that happens to you changes your standing and your responsibility before God as well. So it's an outward sign of an inward grace that gives us a grace, God's love, that we, that we need to attain salvation, food for the journey, but it also changes our standing and our responsibility before God as well. That's what a sacrament is. That's why when someone's ordained, their sacramental character is changed. We have that kind of mark given to us in baptism, in confirmation, and in holy orders if we receive them. You are a priest forever. No matter what happens, you are a priest because that's been tattooed on your soul, if you will. It's a sacramental character. It changes. It changed your rank. Now, keep this in mind. That brand behind the ear. Also, Roman soldiers got a big fat SQR branded on their arms too, that re represented them, that identified them as a Roman soldier. You guys have heard the stories of Roman soldiers who have been unfaithful to Rome, and they even betrayed Rome and fought against their brother soldiers, but they still had the brand on here, right? They're an unfaithful Roman soldier, but notice what I just said. They're still a Roman soldier, just unfaithful. So when we're baptized, we have that sacramental mark put on us. But is it possible to be unbecoming of a child of God? Is it possible to not live, to be unfaithful to that? Absolutely. Can we cut ourselves off from God's love if we choose it? Absolutely we can. Absolutely we can. Remember, God sends no one to hell. People send themselves to hell. They choose not to receive God's love. They choose not to receive His grace. They choose not to receive the sacrament we're going to talk about right now, which is confession. But before we get to that, um, the last part of what I was talking about, a sacrament, uh, the Baltimore Catechism in response to questions 574 and 575 says it all. A, a sacrament is an outward and visible sign instituted by Christ to impart an inward and invisible grace. Jesus Christ Himself is the sacrament as he gave us his life to save mankind and gave us these sacraments to help us lead a Christian life. So he is the sacrament. He is the way, the truth, and the life. This is something groundbreaking for some people because now we start to see the role that the church has too. Remember, the church is the body of Christ. It is the mystical body of Christ, the Catholic churches. Remember, he established one church, not many churches. So the Catholic church is the mystical body of Christ. And because it is the mystical body of Christ, it is the sacrament of salvation. Does that make sense? And so without that sacrament, there is no salvation. This is the perennial teaching that's always been taught, and we have to be mindful of that. So we're, to receive God's grace, he's set up some rules. He's set up some paths. He's given us food for the journey. He's given us things to help us along. And part of these things are the sacraments.
So let's get into con uh, to confession. And I want to talk about the sacrament of confession. And then I want to talk about how to defend it using the sacred scripture. Sound like a plan? Mm -hmm. All right. So we can see in the catechism, those who approach the sacrament of penance obtain pardon from God's mercy for the offense committed against him and are at the same time reconciled with the church which they have wounded by their sins and which by charity, by example, and by prayers, prayer labors for their conversion. I think that says it all, but it also clarifies the point I was trying to make. How can you say we're sinning against the church? Well, we can sin against the church because if we sin against Christ, we are sinning against the church. They're, they cannot be separated, you see? That's important for us to know. That's why in our confidior, you know, we ask for forgiveness for sinning against Christ and the church. Right? Not to separate them, because we sin against both. The, um, the Didache, which is um, a very early writing, probably about A.D. 70 or so, are a collection of some of the early writings of the apostles. And the Didache says, Confess your sins in church and do not go up to your prayer with an evil conscience. This is the way of life. On the Lord's Day, gather together, break bread, and give thanks after confessing your transgressions so that your sacrifice may be pure. And I, I miss the days, I, I know some parishes still do it, but I miss the days where confession was offered right before Mass. Because this made sense, you know? Um, and I wish we had that more often. Not only, not to mention, it also gives us a chance to receive indulgences, which are a teaching of the Church, which are still available to us, but part of that requirement requires us to go to confession too. So I wish we had it more available. Um, and some parishes do do that. I know, I know, they do, they do, some, some do for sure. And then we also have some of the early church fathers that talk about confession as well. The reason I bring this up is very simple. I want you to understand that confession is not something that the church made up. It's not something that we made up back in the 1600s or the 1700s. Confession is something that was taught and commanded by the apostles in A.D. 70. A.D. 70. The apostles, there were some apostles, actual followers, the original apostles, still alive. In fact, the temple probably wasn't even destroyed by then. It was destroyed around that time. I mean, this is really early. People remembered Christ being crucified still. And they're saying that you need to go to confession. By the way, if we ever get into how confessions were done in the old, school, in the old, old church, meaning the primitive church, meaning the church in AD 70, it wasn't behind a curtain to a priest. It was in public. You confessed your sins to everyone. Uh, let's talk about being, you know, people say, I don't want to go to a priest, it's so embarrassing, right? Well, imagine having to say it to everybody. That wouldn't work either, right? And even when they said it to everyone, a priest was present. That's an important point to be made. All right. Now, before we get into um, the biblical foundations, which is very powerful, there's one other thing from the Baltimore Catechism I found that's really important. Because it clarifies for a priest what role he has and what, um, what uh, sacramental power he has to forgive sins. The priest has a power to forgive all sins in the sacrament of penance. But he may not have the authority to forgive all people. To forgive sins validly in the sacrament of penance, two things are required. First of all, in Father's, uh, in father's ordination, he was, given to forgive, he was given the power to forgive sins, all sins. However, he also needs jurisdiction. He needs permission from the ordinary, from the bishop, to forgive, uh, you know, to forgive people. So a per, a people in a certain diocese, the priest needs permission to do that. There's also some sins that are reserved for the bishop to forgive, as well as some that are reserved for the pope. If someone's been excommunicated for certain reasons, the only way for them to be forgiven might be to go to confession to the pope. And usually that's in the form of a public confession too. But it's important for us to know that. That, you know, confession is a real deal. It's not something where the priest is just going to be like, D forgiven, don't worry about it, right? It's a serious thing. It's a very important responsibility and great gift that, um, that priests have. That's why when I see priests at uh, airports and I see, I see the Roman collar on, I, I think they think I'm nuts. But every time before I get on an airplane, heck yeah, I go to confession, you know? Just in case, you know? Um, but, you know, sometimes... Don't be afraid to do that. From my, from my experience, you know, it actually affirms a priest in their priesthood when you ask them for forgiveness. It does. 
especially when it's out in public and it's not just in church in the confessional during the time of confession, it affirms your priesthood. Wow, there's people who believe that I forgive sins. Right? And I've, I even had a priest one time go, I, I asked him, are you a Catholic priest? Yes, I am. Um, will you hear my confession? Do you mean like, like, you want me to forgive your sins now? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, I've never done this outside of a confessional before. I'm like, you know, it affirms them. Sometimes even asking for priestly blessings. We should do that more often too. Father, will you give me a blessing? I had a priest friend who you guys might know. Um, I won't say his name as to embarrass him, but he is a brand new priest. He's only been a priest for two years. And I asked him for a blessing. I just saw him say, Father, will you give me a blessing? He's like, you mean like right here? I'm like, yeah. He's like, wow, okay, um, how do I do this? Like, he never had the, someone come up to him and just, can you give me a blessing? You know? Um, and then there's some priests, like my pastor, when he sees me, he, he, he's just pretending, but he runs away. Because you know I'm going to ask him for some sort of sacrament or some sort of blessing or something, you know? Because they're awesome, and I take advantage of it um, with respect to their time, of course. If they can't hear my confession now because you're going somewhere, I'll bother you tomorrow, you know? <laughs> All right. Now let's get into Scripture. This is the fun part. And as many Catholics, I see that very few of us have our Bibles with us. Next time we'll bring our Bibles with us, but that's why, that's why I printed them all out here, all the scripture passages, right? So you guys can um, have this as a guide, but then also if we do this again with another doctrine, maybe you can bring your Bibles with you. So let's start seeing what the Bible teaches about the sacrament of confession. Now, we know very clearly from scripture that the Bible says that we must confess our sins. And this comes from 1 John chapter 1 verse 9. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Clearly, we're called to confess our sins. And you're not going to have anybody, any Christian, even, even Protestants, fight you on that. We're called to forgive our sins. I agreed. The logical question, though, that follows from this is who do we confess to? It doesn't say in that verse. By the way, one thing that I recommend, that's why I enjoy um, reading it straight from the Bible, is you always want to read in context. Things can be taken out of context very easily. I mean, if you want an example of it, just turn to the book of Job and see some of the parts where there's voices talking to him. You might mistake that God's talking. God's not talking, right? And so it's important for us to read things in context. And if you read this in context, you'd notice that it indeed says that we must confess our sins, but it doesn't say who to confess our sins to. It doesn't say it in that scripture passage at all. And so the question is, who do we confess it to? The first thing that I thought of is, well, what if it's an argument from silence? Meaning, well, if it doesn't say anything, if it doesn't say who to confess it to, then maybe the person that's saying we confess it straight to God is right. If it doesn't say anything else, maybe you're right. Let's just confess it to God. Because it doesn't say anything else. I call it the argument from silence. And I've heard that too. Well, it says to confess to God, and it doesn't say who, so we just confess to God. It says to confess your sins, and it doesn't say to who, so let's just confess it straight to God. Right? The problem is, is the rest of Scripture doesn't stay silent. And Scripture actually does very specifically tell us how and who to confess our sins to. So let's look at... James chapter 5, verse 14 and six, through 16. My wife says I need a new Bible because my Bible's falling apart here. And this is what it says here in James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. If you want to take some notes, this is, this is good stuff here. There's a couple of verses that I think are essential um, in apologetics, in defending the truths of the church. If you want to use the scripture, it really is essential to use some of um, these verses here. James 14 through 16 is one of them. So let's say for example here it says, Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. By the way, this is the verse that's used as a foundation for anointing of the sick. This is the verse that we use to explain that. So you got two and one there. And the prayer of the faith will save the sick man, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another that you may be healed. So it says that, does it say to confess just straight to God? 
No, it says to confess to one another. But we got to make a point here. Back in verse 14, there's a certain word there that's very important. And that word is elders. And in the Greek, that word elders is presbyteral or presbyteros. That word presbyteros is the word that translates into presbyter, which translates into priest. Whenever we see presbyteros anywhere in scripture, it's referring to the priesthood, the ordained ministerial priesthood. So he is just not asking for an older person to come. He's asking for a presbyteros, a presbyter. And in fact, that's also a term um, that priests are you know, referred to sometimes, especially in writings, as presbyter. Because it's just an earlier form of that word priest. And if you look at the Latin Vulgate, um, or the Douay Reims, which is the English translation of the Latin Vulgate, it actually doesn't say elder. It says, call the priest. Because even back then they understood, clearly, this is what it means. It's priest, right? And so, when it says confess to one another, we have an intimation that, first of all, it's not just to confess straight to God silently in our hearts, but it's to confess out loud to somebody else. Because, you know, if we're going to confess to one another, I can't just be like, like, I have to say it, right? That makes sense. I can't just, like the angels, you know, and just you know, telekinetically give it to you, you know, or however that word is, telepathically give it to you. And so we confess out loud, we know that. I got my words wrong. I think telekinesis is when you lift things up or something, right? Whatever, one of those crazy things, right? But remember this, is back in verse 14, we had the presence of the elders. And in the context, remember I talked about reading about context? It's very obvious in this context. By the way, this is not the only, this is not even the remote verse that we're going to use to, you know, substantiate this. But we see that the one that has the power to forgive the sins here is the presbyteros, the elders. Because if you look at verse 14 and verse 15, the one who he anoints and the one who he prays for, that person's sins are forgiven. You see? And so we have the first inclination that we confess it out loud and that we confess it in the presence of a priest. We call the elders and we confess it. And this would make a lot of sense if we were back in the primitive church. Because what happened in the primitive church is we would confess it literally to one another. We'd call the elder and we would confess it out loud and we would be blessed and forgiven by the presbyteros, the presbyter, the priest. So that confess to one another, you have to understand, they're talking about, yes, get in the church and confess it and the priest is going to forgive you. So James chapter 5 verses 14 through 16 is just the very first verse that we have an intimation of how and who to confess the sins to. Who has the power to forgive, which is the elders, who you must call in when someone is sick or when someone needs the forgiveness of sins. But by far, this is not the only verse, nor is it the most direct verse that explains this. Let's take a look at something that's powerful back in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 5 verses 5. 5 through 6. Before we do that though, something before that is we have to understand something. Remember, I said that all, the church teaches that all scripture is inspired and that it is all useful for actually not only the church but the scriptures say that in 2 Timothy 3, it's inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof and correction. And because of that, we're talking all scripture. More specifically, you know, Timothy, uh, Paul writing to Timothy, the New Testament wasn't written yet. So who, what was he talking about? He was talking about the Old Testament. So even though this applies to all of Scripture, he's saying, the Old Testament, Timothy, use it. Because it's going to teach you and teach you and train you for righteousness. So the Old Testament for us is essential for us to help us prepare for the New Testament, to prepare us for what happens in our lives, to prepare us for the new things to come as well. And so, if we have an example in the Old Testament of confession, maybe it's trying to teach us how to go to confession. Maybe he's trying to teach us what the sacrament of confession will be like. And this is startling when most people first see it. Let's take a look at Leviticus chapter 5, verses 5 through 6. It says, When a man is guilty in any of these, he shall confess the sin he has committed, and he shall bring his guilt offering to the Lord for the sin which he has committed, a female, flock, a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat, for a sin offering... And the priest shall make atonement for, for his sin. Again, a man is guilty of sins, he confesses the sins, he brings a guilt offering before the Lord, and the priest atones for his sins. 
That's in Leviticus. I don't know about you, but when I go to confession, I confess my sins, I have to do a guilt offering, I have to do penance. The priest absolves my sins, he atones for my sins. You see? So we have an example in the Old Testament of what I went to two days ago in the confessional. We have an example of someone confessing, of being contrite, of offering a guilt offering, and then the priest atoning for his sins. You see? And so we have an example in the Old Testament of exactly how we're to go to confession. And the Old Testament trains us for the New Testament. Remember, St. Jerome always said that. The Old Testament is revealed in the New, and the New is hidden in the Old. So we have a lot to learn from the Old Testament about what we do now. Don't let anybody ever tell you differently. That's the Old Testament. The Old Testament's the Word of God. And so we can learn a lot from that. But, it doesn't stop here. What I wanted to show you so far is that, number one, that we're called to forgive our, we're called to confess our sins. And we also saw in James chapter 5, that we're called to confess them one another, to one another in the presence of an elder, a presbyteros. And we also see in Leviticus chapter 5, that we have a foreshadowment of the actual sacrament of confession with Leviticus, where they actually go and confess, offer up penance, and then the priest, it even says the word priest in every version of the Bible, every translation of the Bible, to atone for their sins. Okay? So this is very clear. But this is not the end. We have so much more to substantiate that confession, the sacrament of confession, as we as Catholics know it, is biblically based. Only God has the power to forgive sins. As a Catholic, I believe that 100%. But he exercises this power through men, as he does throughout history. This is why I went through the definition of a sacrament earlier. God uses men, and he uses natural means. He uses natural meat. He uses water, right? He uses oil. He uses these things to impart miraculous grace. And he uses men to do it. Remember, in Matthew 28, he didn't say, go forth and just totally tell everybody about my name, right? Go forth and baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. He told them to do that. He was using men to impart a grace to other people. So he uses men to do it. I often think of confession and an analogy. All analogies are imperfect, so if you don't like my analogies, it's okay. <laughs> the analogy I like to use is in the medieval times when a debtor owed the king something. And sometimes the king was having a good day and decided to forgive that debtor of his debt. But the king wouldn't get on his horse and go across the country to say, by the way, you're forgiven of your debt. What would he do? He'd send somebody to do it. An ambassador. That's what Christ does. He is the king and he sends his ambassadors to us to impart his forgiveness. And by the way, that actually said that in scripture. We're going to get to that in a little bit. So we know that God has a power to forgive sins and that he uses men to exercise um, this power. We know that he gives authority to men. Number one. Matthew chapter 9 verses 1 through 8. We can see that here. Getting into a boat, he crossed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Rise, take up your bed, and go home. And he rose up and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid and glorified, who had glorified God, who had given such authority to men. By the way, remember what I said earlier, that what's written in Scripture is what God intended? It doesn't say that he had given authority to a man. The plural is used there in the Greek that he had given authority to men. Not a typo, not an error. It was written for a purpose. So he gave authority to men, plural, to forgive sins. By the way, I love this verse because, you know, his example of which is easier, to say rise up and walk or to forgive sins. I love what Thomas Aquinas said. He said that it is a greater miracle to have sins forgiven than to even resurrect the dead. 
How awesome is that? That is amazing. And that's why I love going to confession. I don't love going to confession. <laughs> I, I, I wish I didn't have to, but when I receive that, I love the sacramental grace that comes with confession. Because I know that it's, it's a miraculous thing. You see? It's horrible. Man, I can't wait to go to purgatory. Well, you shouldn't want to go to purgatory, but you know, um, you should want to go to heaven, you see. Um, I do that all the time. People go like, man, you must sin a lot, huh? Yes, actually. Um, then we see in John 17, 18. As thou didst send me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. You see, he had the authority to forgive sins. And he says, so as a father has sent me, so I send you. And so Christ had the authority to forgive sins. And he ascends his apostles to do the same. Now let's move on to another one. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Second Corinthians. This is huge. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 18 through 21. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of himself, of reconciliation, sorry. So we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We beseech you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so, what it's saying here is that Christ entrusted them with the message of reconciliation. If I'm not mistaken, the Dewey Round says the ministry of reconciliation. That he entrusted them with the ministry of reconciliation. And so we are ambassadors for Christ. Guess what the word ambassador there is? Presbyteros. Right? So we, the presbyteros, or and there it's a different um, conjugation of it. It's pres presbumuin, but it means presbyteros. It means presbyter, it means priest. We are priests of Christ who have been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. Paul himself says, we, the ordained priest, have been given the authority and the ministry to forgive sins. Very clear. But let's move on because it's not done yet. And that same, um, in the same book, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. What I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. I love this because it is not the priest who has the, has, uh, has the power or has the, the, the organic, intrinsic right to forgive. He is an ambassador for Christ. He has the authority through Christ. He acts in the person of Christ. This is essential. In persona Christi. He acts in persona Christi. And that's why, if um, I love, if you've ever gone to a high mass, um, uh, the traditional Latin Mass, during that, that third absolution, right before, the, um, right before we receive the Eucharist, I love when the priest turns around and he's kind of facing sideways. Yeah? He's not facing like this. He's kind of facing sideways and he says the words of absolution. I think that's beautiful because he is basically allowing God to forgive your sins. I mean, he's not allowing. He's basically in that act showing that he is delivering God's forgiveness to you, that absolution. Beautiful. Just a gesture. Just turning from here to here has theological meaning, you know? I think that's awesome. But so, priests act in persona Christi, and that's why they have a sacramental character, and that's why um, their ordination is sacred. Um, and we must always respect their ordination. Even if you don't get along with the priest, you respect the sacramental, char sacramental character that they have. Um, and that's important to know. In persona Christi. Now, this is it. This is the big verse here. John 20, 21 through 23. This is, if you want to circle it, this is like, you can call it the power verse. This is the power verse that you can use. If you can only have time to speak about one verse to explain to a non-Catholic about confession, use this one. John 20, 21 through 23. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. All right? So this is a very, very powerful thing. In fact, I believe an ordination happened here. Not just the authority to forgive sins, but an actual priestly ordination. A couple of reasons. Um, the only other time God, in all of Scripture, the only other time that God breathed on man, you guys know when that was? I, I wrote it right there. Adam. It's when he created man. He breathed life into them. Right? That's the only other time in Scripture where he breathes life. So we know that something drastic happens when God's going to breathe on somebody. And so when Jesus said, when Jesus says in the Scripture, um, he breathed on them, something s sacramental, something characteristic, something fundamental is changing. Something is changing to the per people who he's speaking to. And what is that? Well, the church and many church fathers have said that they are becoming priests at that moment. They are being ordained. They are receiving a sacramental change, which Father received when he was ordained, right? And so he received, they receive this ordination, and they're given the authority to forgive sins. Now, keep this in mind. It says something very important here. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. That's enough. We, we know, and then using all the rest of Scripture, we know that they're talking about the presbyteros. Scripture, scripture doesn't say otherwise. That's important to know, too. If people want to disagree with everything that I said here, the Scripture doesn't say anything else. There's nothing else to the contrary, you see. So anything else that's believed is just not biblical. They can believe it, but it's not biblical. This is what the Bible says about confession. If you believe otherwise, then you're just believing something that's not biblical. I'm not judging you. I'm just saying it's not biblical. That drives them nuts. Because they, they believe that they believe in the Bible. Well, this is what the Bible says about confession. Now, important point here. If you forgive the sins of any, you are forgiven. That should be the end. Enough. But it also says if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now, this is important for many different reasons. First of all, a priest has the authority to not forgive your sins. And this is... <laughs> have you ever had that happen? Because I have. And the priest just said, you're obviously not sorry. And he was totally right. You need to think about this. And it was a blessing for me that he retained that. Because I had time to reflect and to find true sorrow for it. Instead of just saying it. Yeah, I mean, this is not my confession. But, I mean, if you walk into the church, you know, a confession, like, so, uh, yeah, I killed somebody. And um, anyway, yeah. He's not going to absolve you. I mean, you had no sorrow. You weren't sorry for what you did, you see. So the priests have a right to retain that, that forgiveness. But remember this, retain that sin. But this is also very telling. Because if they have the right to either forgive or to not forgive sins, that means they've been given the what? The authority to judge the penitence of a person. To judge the contriteness of the, of the penitent. Basically, they have the authority to judge whether or not you're sorry or not. That's point number two. Point number three, priests are not mind readers. Most, anyway, aren't mind readers. What does that mean? You have to confess it out loud. How can a priest exercise his jurisdiction and his authority to forgive or to not forgive sins if he can't hear your confession? You see where I'm going? So John 20:21 20, not only shows us the ordination, not only shows us that the priests were given authority to forgive sins and to retain sins, but also, not only to judge the sorrow of someone, but it also intimates the necessity of saying it out loud. A priest must hear your confession in order to forgive your sins. Does that, does that make sense? Because without it, then none of this makes sense. Why would he give them the authority to retain the sins? You have to say it out loud. Not to mention, the rest of Scripture doesn't say otherwise. And we also have this backed up in James chapter 5 where it says to confess to one another as an out loud. Right? So, in summary, let's just go through this real quick. Maybe I can answer a couple questions. The Bible clearly says... I don't know how to write a book clearer. In the summary, the Bible clearly says that we must confess our sins to God. That we must confess our sins, number one. We must confess our sins to one another in the presence of the priest, the presbyteros, James 5.16. The Old Testament prepares us for the process of confessing to sins, confess the sin, 
offer a guilt offering and the priest atones for the sins. We see that Christ has the authority to forgive sins, that he gives the authority to his disciples, John 17, 18, and John 20, 21 to 23. And we also know that these are the same people, as Paul points out, the presbyteros, who are now the ambassadors for the ministry of forgiveness. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 through 21. And so just using those passages, you can take anybody through an apologetic. That's what an apologetic is, by the way. Apologetics is not the process by which we apologize for our faith. Apologetics comes from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, where it says that we must be prepared to give an explanation to those who question the faith that we have, the hope that we have. So we must know how to explain. In other words, you know, I think sometimes we misunderstand charity. Because when someone comes up to you and says, well, you're Catholic, well, can you explain to me why you believe, you know, that Christ is truly present in the Eucharist? Or that the Mass is a propitiatory sacrifice? And your response is, man, I love Jesus, don't you too? I mean, you just kind of avoid the question, you never answer it. It's okay, it doesn't matter, just, just, just be together and love each other. You see, people have that mentality these days. And if you respond, they're like, you're being so uncharitable. No, we're called by Scripture to give hope. Because as a friend of mine just told me recently, and it made a lot of sense, is that because Christ is the fullness of truth, because He is truth, and because He is charity, you can't separate them. You can't separate them. And so to be charitable is to give them the truth. Otherwise, you're separating Christ. To be charitable is to give the truth. And that's why I'm blessed that they invite me up here, you know, and the diocese asked me to go, but there are some people who don't want to hear me talk. Because the things that I say bother them. That the Catholic Church is the church. It is the body of Christ. That without the church, there is no salvation. I'm not making it up. The church teaches it. But that's so before Vatican II. Vatican II didn't change that, but people don't want to hear it. But if I, know, if I don't give that, then I'm failing to give truth. And then I'm failing to be charitable to everyone.